All right, guys, let's call the uh, work session uh, to order. Um, we got a pretty short agenda tonight, uh, luckily, so maybe we can get through a lot of our uh, council agenda. Um, the first thing, uh, and, and let me say this before we get into the, the two things that are on here. Is anybody council or mayor, do y'all have anything y'all want to discuss right now since we have a little bit of open time? I'll do it. Yeah, I'll, I'll bring up some things. It's just as well to put them in a work session as council comments. I just, uh, I just kind of direct this maybe uh, to the mayor, maybe even pose it as a question. Uh, and and uh, I've been just, it just, you know, things are cyclical on the council. Sometimes you get bombarded with things and sometimes it's you know it's just a little slower it seemed like lately i've been getting a lot of questions from media types and uh james uh over here about, <coughs> about about things that i feel like the council should hear about before the media or the general public and i i, I don't know how you solve all that i just it's a work session i thought i'd just toss it around i would feel better if I knew, if I was a little more educated on some things before a citizen calls me and asks me and I'm caught completely off guard. I know it's happening. You're never going to be 100% perfect. Now, are you, um, one thing that could help, one thing that could help um, is, are you getting all the minutes to all the meetings and I, I am, the but this is, these are stuff? things that are more real time. Okay. These are things like, uh, maybe it's a, of a police nature or something like okay. that. Uh, you know, I I'm, I'm feel like I'm getting my news from the nightly news instead of from the proper channels. Okay. It's a, yeah. not a big thing. That's why if I you, bring And it if here, you want to give a, me some specifics, I can, I can, maybe we can find a solution. Um, I, I feel like if it's... Uh, I feel like I communicate quite yeah, a bit. I feel so. like if it's newsworthy enough, like if it's a police report that makes the news, then I think maybe that we should get a text message or something to give us a heads up about it. Okay. Uh, thing, things like that. Okay. Just, just, you know, okay. think about it. I mean, okay. you know, I don't expect you to come up with a solution, and I don't have a solution. And there are times where, I mean, you know, I will communicate with the council president or um, the council pro tem or, <laughs> you know, like when Jimmy was council president, I will communicate with them things that, that I don't necessarily think the whole council needs to know. Maybe I need to expand upon that, or that could be Jay using his discretion, mm -hmm. and if he feels like it needs to be shared with everybody, um, I'm happy to do that, but... Yeah, yeah, I can say, Jack, just as, as a, for instance, the police thing that you talked about, there were numerous times during this last year as when I was pro tem that I would get texts from the mayor to, to Jimmy and to myself about updates if there were, you know, some specific police incident here or there. Um, and so, yeah, it's probably uh, probably the job of the council president then to, to make sure that that information is communicated to you guys and so i think you should share it with all of us i think that we're equal uh unless we're in the meeting by running a meeting we're all equal so i'd like to have okay. that information but i think sometimes that council president gets a little bit imposed upon as far as not being equal at times there, there as, far no as, doubt about that. as far as information i'm just saying habitually <laughs> or traditionally this has been the way um, and I kind of, my first year, I felt like that because it was my first year yeah. president. You kind of feel a little bit out of loop because it really doesn't get kicked around like that. And then you come in, you find out, but everybody else knows. Yeah. And I think and so I, this so, could be, you know, yeah. just me, you know, not being council president, not getting as much as I, I got. But right. I think sometimes that's a, a function of it being when I was council president. I expected some of that and asked for some of that. And I, and I don't know that that wasn't so much because I was council president as, as it is that I was, I just happened to be a councilman that was the council right. president. And I feel like the councilmen should all get that information. So yeah. just something to bring up now. Um, and then uh, another subject that I want to just touch on, I was going to touch on it. So now is a better time to talk about it is that just to uh, ask that we all are kept abreast if it's a council function and I'll be specific here um, you know there was bike trail found out on public property uh, recently and uh, not not trying to make a big issue out of that I know it was some youngsters that, that did it from what I understand but I don't think that any anyone except the council as a body can decide what somebody can do with public property and not and a committee can't do it uh, no one in the city can do it 
if it's something like that. I just think that we need to be mindful of what we allow. And, and, the, and the reason is because if we let people get away with building a bike trail on public property, you can't stop anybody from putting whatever they want. If I want to go to Henry George Park and put a, put a bike trail there or on the four acres there, um, there on Bayview, I'm trying to think of the name of the park. I just think that we should make sure that the council's kept abreast of what's going on with the city property because the real property of the city of Fairhope strictly falls under the purveyance of the, of the council. Are, are you talking specifically about the, the trails that were put in at the Triangle property? Right. And, okay. and then I was told that it went to a, it was brought it, very recently and it was brought to the attention of a committee who, I don't know if they just gave an okay to the people to use it or, or what, but I, I just don't think we can do that. I think no. that we have to. I can speak on that. I was at that committee meeting. That's when I found out about it. Or maybe right before the meeting, I found out about it. I think the mayor had expounded to me. Um, there were some children, um, no particular names, but uh, I think they were not being destructive, but constructive, but just out of order and wanting to create a trail. Um, and for what I understand, they did a pretty good job, but that's here and nay. Um, but it, I don't think. Um, it, 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 they, they did stop them. I don't know what happened with the kids. I know one of them presently helps now with the committee, you know, so. Um, yeah, but, but it seemed like we kind of, I don't know, I got the feeling we looked the other way because my, my problem is that not so much this, but if somebody wants to go build a baseball diamond on an open field that's public property, we just can't do it. We, we lock the parks out there at Volantis so people won't use the parks. Mm -hmm. And we have all these other places that, you know, you can't really lock up, but it doesn't give people the right to go out there and build whatever recreational opportunity they want for themselves on city property. I'm just saying let's be mindful and let's, let's communicate with everybody. And if, if something needs to be brought to this body, then let's decide what the best use of that is. And in this case, we already have a study going on for the north part of the Triangle property. And we actually even approved some funding, if you recall, for a uh, bike uh, path on the north side. I think it was 9000 or $10,000 that we approved that prior administration never spent to build those trails. So, Yeah, and maybe that's what I'm thinking of, because I, I could have sworn that in these, in, in maybe it was a work session or actual council meetings, we discussed some of the, you know, I don't know if it was these particular group of teenagers, but but it was a group of, of individuals kind of allowing them with some supervision to... No, that was... I think uh, that was the mountain bike trail group that okay. that had been approved. And, and this group of kids, they didn't come ask permission. They did. Um, yeah. They did not come ask permission. The first time I found out about it was when there was some tools confiscated by Gary Gover. And I said, just give them their tools back. To my knowledge, they... Still have not they've been up there riding the trails I don't know that they've been building anything additional right. they will do just like at the skate park like turn over some picnic tables or some barricades and try to ramp them or whatever um, I do know that Katie Bolton you know she had been up there she said I don't want to do any of those jumps that are up there um, and we have talked about a uh, matter of fact I got back with Richard today on we had talked about possibly putting some signs up there about at your own risk because we know we can't we can't secure that whole park, that whole spe green space. But it is something that we put one of those kids on the steering committee because we wanted their input, because from what we've been told, they're decent trails. Um, but we, we know that we're focusing right now on the North Park. That's been, has been talked about in the steering committee meetings and that eventually we'll get to the South Park and bike trails are what's possibly planned for there. But we're not ready to address that just well, yet. We, we've actually approved funding for them to be put on the North Park, but like I said, it didn't happen. But, I, you know, you know, I had a parent call me, and, uh, you know, I said, look, we're not trying to criminalize this. We're not, we're not trying to get anybody in trouble, but we just, you, you, can't, you can't allow one person to do something, not allow everybody to do it. If you get yourself in trouble as a city, it's just a wrong precedent to set. But I do question whether it was just done by a bunch of kids, because there's a lot of trees that have been cut by chainsaws out there. Yeah. And you can see that somebody has used a chainsaw throughout that property to cut those trees. 
I don't think those were kids. Uh, they had some help, and, and, and they're not massive trees, but in certain places, they cut trees. It, you can see clearly in multiple places the trees were cut. Yeah, it's been grown. It's deer stands been found out there, from what I understand. Yeah, there so there's adults. There's yeah. adults that go through there as well. We're not just right. gonna blame it on the kids. Well, I don't think that yeah. the hunters were cutting trees with chainsaws. I'm so just saying. If this was like in the in the where the trail goes through, they uh, they clearly wanted to clear the tree so the the bike path could go through there. Mm -hmm. right. Well, look, I don't think anybody would argue the fact that if that if that you know. We can't have private citizens going out and making material changes to public right. property without permission that's, that's from, right. from the council. That's the point. Um, but uh, I, I get your point. Is that, did you have anything else to add on that topic? No, sir. Anything else that you guys wanted to bring up before I start getting into committee updates? No, that's good. Okay. All right, well, committee updates then. Councilman Burrell? I have no committee updates. Uh, yeah, I think I have a couple of, I um, was able to go um, um, to the um, rec, rec board meeting and and I think uh, I think the mayor had spoken of it, but I think um, most of it's been public. I think the lights were going up um, on the new fields, the LED lighting was going up. Um, the fencing was out for a bid. Um, the track bid is out. Um, there was a pickleball bid that was out. Um, there was some other things. Um, we talked about, um, and I'll, I'll bring this up in public because I, want, I think this Jay would appreciate this, um, possibly um, having some shade coverings at that ballpark and thinking about that as we, Absolutely. you know, the new and old. I don't know what that looks like, but you know, we travel around the city. <coughs> you, it's, you can it's very uh, just yeah, so people don't heat you, stroke. You see uh, that at, at, in various ways at other facilities. Yes, and I think there are are some cost efficient options, options that right. can be done to accomplish that. Right. I don't think it's it's overwhelmingly financially, and I think that it'll be a great um, a great um, thing for the citizens to have cover. In the middle of the summer, I don't know if any of you've been out there with baseball like that, being a parent, and it it gets pretty hot out there. Um, so um, that's some of the things that we talked about. Um, 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 we also um, we were speaking on you know um, basketball as well. We need more basketball facilities. These are all the things that we already know, um, and um, I agreed. I think we had over 600 kids sign up for basketball this particular time. Um, so the, the, the kids are outgrowing the community as far as indoor opportunities. Um, so that's something that we really, really need to focus on. Um, but that's about it. Um, we'll talk about the triangle later for the Fair Health Environmental. Um, but that's all I have. Mr. Chairman, I want to go back. I actually did, uh, I did uh, have one more subject. It's a good work session topic. And uh, Mayor, you may have heard from this citizen as well. I had a phone call uh, this afternoon. And, and, and once again, this is kind of one of those things, I don't even know if you can solve this. Uh, it's just it's something that, you know, people may never be pleased. Uh, and that it has to do with the garbage collection around holidays. And, you know, if you're on that Tuesday, Friday, and, uh, and I'm on that, and, and it didn't bother me because we never fill up our garbage can in, anyway, it's never a problem for us, and, and recycling we can we can always wait a week or two. Uh, but I guess for those that maybe have large families or have large holiday gatherings and they can't throw their garbage away, they, they wonder if there's something they can do because you know, we always have holidays on Friday or Monday, right? So it always affects these people the most. And I just I, I told the citizen that I would bring it up next opportunity, and so now we have a few minutes. So I don't I don't not looking for a solution. I don't even know if there is a solution. Uh, but, you know, uh, they, they said they wanted another garbage can. I said, well, that'll cost you an extra 20 a month. Um, and I don't know that you can do anything about it. And, and you're really only talking about a couple of times a year. I understand that, you know. Um, but still, I, I did tell the citizen I'd bring it up for some kind of thought. It, you know, you start messing with the routine 
in and around holidays, it just kind of throws everything. It can throw weeks off, I guess. It'd probably throw three weeks garbage collection off if you try to solve solve it for just that select group of people. And I think, think about it. there's probably only a couple holidays, Christmas, where you're closed half a day, and then um, I guess Christmas and New possibly um, Thanksgiving that yeah, you would have yeah. those those real issues. And, and we have in the past, there have been times where it's been authorized to do overtime and allow them to run. Um, you know, we've, yeah, we've stopped doing that to give much. them time to spend with their families. Um, yeah. So, and again, it is only a couple times a year, so yeah. I don't know that it's worth that. Th that yeah. was the one solution that I thought that might be viable. But I, yeah. You know, like you say, if they want to yeah. spend time with family, you don't right. want to force them right. over time. But I guess maybe I could ask the question, is there a certain core group of employees that would like to work overtime? And what that would mean, would it would probably mean a little extra, yeah. you know, maybe extra some extra time. passes. Right, uh, right. Or and could, we, could we, somebody call in and just say, hey, I, I've got a, I need two runs today or something like that? Is that, that I don't that know. Too, I, we can look at the logistics right. of it. I just don't know. Because you can't drive every yeah. street looking for no, that one person. No. That I just don't know that it'd be worth it for just those few times that it's well, We have to think issue. about it, but yeah. it's good. That maybe you could, you could, uh, maybe you could during that time, if you think you're going to be overwhelmed with trash, you could maybe come rent an extra garbage can. Garbage can maybe check it out and, and return it. I don't know. I'm just, I mean, it's, you know. A $5 charge? For yeah, $5 charge for one-time charge for one time charge, rental something like that. during that time. I mean, I, you know, but. Richard, are we really mucking this up? In well, the and, and, and I mean, let's tell you, the, the one saving grace we have is for residential customers is twice a week. So let, let's really talk about hardship. So if you're a Monday customer, you, uh, Thanksgiving week, you got picked up Monday. You didn't get picked up Thursday but you got picked up today. So how long did you have to go right. uh, with that ownership, with where that everybody else in the world, including me, only right. gets once a week anyway? I, so, so for one week a year, maybe two, most of our citizens experience what everybody else experiences all 52 weeks a year. Now, just so you know, the, the, the tough customers that we do have to take care of what we call our commercial backdoor customers, yes, employees come in and work on that Friday and Saturday of that holiday because the restaurants are open and, and downtown the shops are open, there's, there's heavy shopping on Friday, they're producing a lot of material and, and there's no capacity, there's no, there's no room in the alleys and there's not enough places for carts. So we do have folks that get assigned duties uh, to work on holidays uh, because there's just no option but really, I, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not sure I'm prepared to feel bad for citizens that twice a week have to suffer what I suffer personally at my home every week of the year uh, because they at least get picked up once that week. And so that, that is, you know, I, I don't know how you... high price of living in Fairhope. Well, I mean, we want to give them good, good service. I mean, but I, I don't... I don't I, I'm, I'm not sure that how we would it would it would either be on, on on residential garbage it would be all or none. You couldn't just go run part of a route because I think that would make people more upset that it. Well, why did they get picked up and I didn't get picked well, up? Well, let me tell you the rest of the story. The citizen went on to tell me that they ended up taking their additional garbage to the dump for the city, at which time the attendant followed them up the hill and started accusing them of putting, you know, because there's the things out there of throwing this out and this out and this out, of which they didn't throw out. And I think that that's what really upset the citizen and uh, that they were mistreated at the landfill. And so you can look into that. Okay. Well, and and I'll share the person's name with you in private. Well, I mean, I, and, and again, the landfill is trash, and I thought we were talking about residential garbage. So. Well, that's, I did it, So. Uh -huh. they, they, that, that was their conversation they had with me. They didn't, I didn't think you could throw out residential garbage, but, but they took it there. That's what they, they made it sound like they took their But the, 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 the gate wouldn't there. have been open those days either. Yeah, it, was it was closed. Well, I don't know what day they took it. They could have taken it in, you know, any day. Okay. I'll, I'll show you the person. You'll, you'll be okay. nice to know. You'll be okay. interested well, to know. I just, I, I mean, I just, I do know that every citizen gets picked in the Thanksgiving week got picked up once. So, okay. thank you. Um, you, the method that I have chosen and found to be most appropriate is to take one of your small children and let them stand on your garbage and really jump up and down and smash it to where you can fit more in your can. That's, if you still have small children. My children are <laughs> rentable to smash your garbage if you need it. Say, so I have one other um, thing that you might be 
on the historical. I know you're on the historical. Yeah. So here, you, this is. This is. Are you serving me papers here? Yeah, I'm serving you this? papers. So you, I'll let you. That should be going to you. I got it sent, but I make sure that was taken care of. You want me to speak on it? Or? Yeah, please go yeah, ahead. Yeah. So what I just passed, Jay, was the Alabama um, um, Historical Commission that has officially certified um, Miss um, Miss um, 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 for the house on on Nichols. Um, the young lady that was a slave, excuse me, I, I'm thinking uh, Nancy Lewis. Nancy Lewis, yeah, Miss Lewis. Miss Lewis' house is now archived at the state level by the Histor Alabama Historical Commission. There's the official paperwork. Jay's on historical, so he can get that to Hunter or, yeah. or whoever wants to put that in a documentation somewhere. Yeah, and that, that sort of leads me into my committee uh, yeah. comments. Is I, we had a, a meeting of the Historic Preservation uh, committee last Wednesday, two Wednesdays ago, before Thanksgiving. Um, and, and the fact that this house was torn down recently was, was part of that discussion and on whether or not there are better ways for the committee to go about preserving and protecting uh, things like this. And one of those, one of the ideas or the comments again was uh, the idea of a historical preservation ordinance, which uh, I don't know that this council has discussed before but was discussed at length with the prior council um, and ultimately was not passed for, for I think a variety of reasons um, but but I think the preservation committee's uh, position is wanting to figure out a better way to not only get their message out but to have more influence when things like the Nancy Lewis house uh, and then they also specifically uh, mentioned one of the buildings downtown um, that's currently up for sale and ways to go about preserving those things. Hardware. Yeah, I don't know that there is a, a, a cookie cutter perfect option for that um, because I do think historic preservation is probably a, a, some, something that is going to be a, a case by case basis. Um, you know, I don't think, my personal thought, uh, you know, just in general is I don't think Fair Hope is the kind of place for everything's got to be the same color, everybody's, everything's got to be the same design because that's not really what Fair Hope was created like and I don't know that that fits. Uh, but you do have to have the ability, I think, to protect historic structures. I think that's the idea. And I think that's the message, but I think it gets lost in the other things that I just talked about where you're trying to make everything look the same. Well, and I, I don't I think don't, that's the case. I, Jay, if I may, Council Chair, I, I don't think that historical preservation, um, you know, Mobile has had a historical preservation. It's a much bigger metropolitan. There's other places that have historical uh, preservations. Um, but if you read that ordinance, which I have, it's really clear cut in how that would look and how it would work. Um, everything would not have to be cookie cutter. You would pick districts, mm -hmm. and there would be a committee that would pick districts to create or see where that should go as far as the comprehensive plan or, you know, planning concerns. So it's not uh, the idea of everything looking the same, but you do when something as significant as the house on Bayview that no one really speaks about uh, by the tree that was demolished and then the one right around the corner from it that was also demolished that no one wants to speak about that you get some outsider that's got an aerial view and, and drops the finger and says I want to buy that tear that history down and somebody's whole life history is taken out I think that's significant I think um, I think we could do a better job of preserving the history um, that uh, people before has left. I think it's important to have a memory of those situations and document where they are. If you don't know where you come from, you're not gonna know where you're going. I think it's important to teach our children that. Um, so I think we're smart enough to come up with some type of idea to stop this process, this pattern that we see that's happening in Fairhope right now. I don't think it's about making everybody cookie cutter, but I think it is about preserving our history or we won't have one. Well, and, and I think you know, maybe using the word cookie cutter was was a misstatement, but having something that tells someone who comes into Fairhope and buys a piece of property, here's what it's zoned for, 
So you're, you're limited already in what the zoning is for this piece of property, but not only are you limited by the zoning, you're also limited by this other ordinance that says, this is what it's gotta look like, this is what the color has to be, or, or it's gotta be decided by this group what it is. I mean, I think that, I think continuing to place limitations on property rights, it's, it's troubling. Now, I don't, I don't disagree with you that if we continue to bulldoze every historic structure in Fairhope for a McMansion or a, uh, some development of some kind, I think that's a big, I think that's a problem also. So I think we've got to take the time to have a discussion to figure out what the best compromise is that, that allows property rights but also protects the integrity of the history that you're talking about. And I think there is a middle ground. Yes. And obviously I don't think we've found that because we haven't, we haven't, uh, we haven't been able to reach any agreement on it. So well, I, I think there's. I don't know if we ever dove that deeply into it as a body. Yet. I think we did the last time. I mean, I mean we I had meetings in the work session uh, the last time with, with people from the historic preservation. And, and Gary, you might be able to answer that, but somebody from the state came down or something that was trying to get us and, and and whatever the whatever that presentation was, I think seemed at least in my recollection to be uh, the opinion of the council was that was too burdensome and wasn't something that we were interested interested in at that time. Now, if there are different um, different versions that we could consider there and are. put in place, then that might be something that we need to put on a work session in the yeah. future. Yeah, I have it. It's it, you can you can make that thing how you want it. You know, um, it's a fluid document. You know. Well, but um, I do think I do think in order fair. for it to qualify as a as an ordinance within the whatever the state recognizes, I do think there are certain things that have to be. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, Hunter, please come on. Yes. Please. So so I I don't know that it's we can make it whatever we want it because I think in order for it to mean what it's designed to mean, it's got to have certain things. There are certain things that has to be in there, but there are certain things that you can kind of <coughs> make to fit Fairhope. Right. Yeah. And, and and we're actually ahead of the game, have been for years on that, a lot of those requirements. So it's a little different what, what um, was done, it was a designation of a landmark at, at 309 Ingleside. Um, that means something significant happened on this piece of land and it will ride with that land forever. And then you also have districts. And we have districts. They were created. The studies were done. We've hired people uh, twice to come in. And you have to continually, uh, to keep a historic district once established, you have to continually to monitor that. So every time somebody renovates a house, that can take away from the, the qualifying properties within that district or support those. Um, we have those in place now. We just don't have the local legislation, ordinance. if you will, to ordinances to, to, so that's where you do have some flexibility. <coughs> where it gets a little challenging is those are based on a district and you, it's a, a one-off building that may be out somewhere else. It's hard to write an ordinance for that with a district. And you can certainly not have architectural standards to the point where you're telling people what paint colors but you have to have some procedure that's keeping that a historic building to be a qualifying building. And I forget where the number is. I think it's something like 50%, you know, has to be a qualifying um, to keep your district. So once you establish those, uh, so that becomes, I think, where the challenge is when you get into pro pro property rights versus historic preservation is what are you going to regulate? You know, you can you see some cities like Savannah that they're telling you exactly what kind of windows and, you know, uh, or, you know, do you, do you just have an approval of any renovation so that it, it doesn't impact the qualifications? And I think there's there's some ways we can get to there. So, and, and I'm just, Hunter, I, I'm not meaning to put you on the spot, sure. yeah, but I'm just trying to understand it for my own education, and that is, so let, let's say you had some designated uh, historic preservation districts, mm -hmm. all right? And it, let's say that they've got to meet, that district has to meet 50% qualifications for that designated district. Mm -hmm. And so you've got 
a house in that area or a building in that area that, that I buy and I want to make changes to. Um, I've got to present that to someone because if I make too many changes to that building, it could drop that designated dome or zone below or yes. uh, whatever the percentage is it has to be. Yeah. And so even if that improvement improves the quality and the use of this particular structure, mm -hmm. I might be told no because then we lose our historic preservation it, and, and that's that's the risk I think we're in right now with some of the new, you know, we've had a lot of them recently. I mean, people coming in tearing down homes because <laughs> it's sitting on two lots or, you know, for a variety of reasons. So I think before we had did anything with local ordinance, we would have to review, revise and pay somebody to come in. It wouldn't be as expensive as the first two times, but they would have to go in and, all right, look at the last study, I believe 2015, does that sound about right? You know, and take a look at that again to see if the districts we have are actually still valid. Uh, but yes, you're thinking about that exactly right. We would, if we establish a district with an ordinance to protect that district, then we at least have to have some private property, you know, conflicts with private property rights to say, well, you can't exceed, you know, collectively. And then you really get into, okay, what are you going to allow? One person to remove demo completely? Well, and that's and, that's and other people my, have to be. And, and I'm and maybe I'm thinking like a lawyer here, but I'm thinking let's say you have a zone that's seventy percent. It's got to maintain fifty. <coughs> yeah. Marcus comes in and bulldozes his house because bulldozing it only drops us down to sixty, right. and then Corey bulldozes his and drops us down to fifty-five. So but then boom, I want to make some fifty percent adjustments to mine, and you say not so fast because your renovations will then drop us below that 50 percent we That's, can't allow but, that to but happen. you couldn't bulldoze per the alabama it, ordinance if uh it's by what the, the what the local yes well i read the alabama the 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 the, the generic ordinance you, that doesn't allow that to happen but hypothetically they, they, they do any, have a template it, it wouldn't of let you bulldoze system. anything in the zone that's at exactly all right. that's up for that's what exactly you right. adopt but that's what the template that's what the, that's what I'm telling you. But in the uh, one you spoke of, where they said the state had a right. I've read it. You well, cannot. But, okay. Do that. Well, let's take bulldozing out. Let, okay. Let's let's, let's say that. that 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 Marcus makes major renovations to his house, drops us down to 55. Corey makes major renovations to his, to drop us down to 51. Okay. I come in with the same plan that both of them presented with the same renovations, but you tell me no because then that would drop us below our 50 percent. And that's any solution would have to be equitable. I think and that's so how, something so, we would have to. Know, I mean, if you're third in line and you just don't get the same deal that everybody before you got, I mean, I just see that from a an equity standpoint being really hard to enforce and and the root of some strong liability. We're, we're already seeing lawsuits in the city for property rights as is. Right. If you start doing something like that, that doesn't allow fair treatment amongst like individuals then and, and I always say you know it's absolutely having the rules people at least understand what those are so adopting whatever those may be is an equitable solution yeah. Yeah. having ah, we're right. good until we we have a problem is right. not equitable and, and invites those lawsuits. yeah and I'm not saying I'm yeah. against any of it I'm just yeah. I'm just trying to think through the problems so, of it so, so yeah those those are the the, the, the far spectrum problems but what I see is if you if you coming in and you're buying in a historical district, right? You know you're buying in a historical district, right? Right. So you must be for history. So why would you then want to go oppose it unless you just want to stir up trouble? Or unless you're buying it like most people are buying these properties in Fairpas for the money. Well, what I'm That's saying right. is if they're buying it in that district, if it says historical district, right? I mean. I think you're giving these people a lot more credit than I am. Yeah, I think, I, I, I think you, know, you buy. I think you buy a house in historic. Well, I just lived in Mobile, and you know, most people go and they literally buy historically on purpose, and they know what they're getting because they want that plaque. Yeah, I think. I think. I mean, they they I, literally want that plaque. They don't want to do anything to it. They love the grandeur of it. They love the authenticity of it. They love the antiquity of it, and they know what they're getting into. And I, I will say um, that's why they have historical districts. I think I think you're right, and I think I'm I'm, yeah. a, I'm an advocate, so I'm, yeah. all cards are on the table. I like rules, and I'm, I'm I'm okay with you know violating private property rights as long as we're doing it equitably. Equitably, um, I don't like telling people what kind of wrought iron and paint colors. I don't yeah. think that is the the right solution. 
But I also want to be clear, you know, not everything that is old is historic. Right. You know, and there can be sentimental attachments to things that are by those state regulations doesn't or, or federal does not make it historic qualifying as historic. So we I don't think we can get the solution. I think some people won't like no change. <laughs> that, that's that's not a reasonable goal. But I, I do think we, we can come up with some some ideas. Um, yeah. and, and it could just be a review procedure. Um, you know, you hear these boards and committees that have reviews, but they are very strict. They tell people paint colors, architectural standards, historic preservation uh, commissions that actually review every project. Other places do things like a design review that's a little softer. Um, it puts it through a public process and maybe before whatever follows, whether that's a site plan review, a MOP project, they have to go to this design review and and get approval for a demolition or a 50% right. completion. Maybe there's, there's, a, there's a step in there. Mm -hmm. It takes longer um, to get to, but I don't think we're gonna do anything that doesn't add some, some review or, or um, time to the equation. I, I do too think that that design review would allow <laughs> us to work with the property owners to do some of the education that we've talked about. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that Hunter and I have talked about before James Watkins goes and reports to everybody with the Fairhope Times that I said that I thought we could get the votes from the, the city council um, for historic preservation. My comments were that if we came up with an ordinance that was vague enough but gave some concessions when people want to preserve a home, that I think that the council could get on board with that and I think that we could get the votes that we needed. But I think there has to be some more discussion and I think the design review is a good option for that and again allows us to do that education that we need to do. And, and there's, there's, I think we can set it up where there's actually some incentives locally. I mean, some of the tax base incentives, especially in Alabama, have been hit or miss. I mean, there's, there's an incentive, but sometimes the state funds it, sometimes they don't. Sometimes there's money available, sometimes there's not at the state level. But, I mean, we've, Eric's been looking at a, a, a variance, building department variance for permitting. Um, that's a lot of times a, a, a big hurdle for people to overcome remodeling some of these historic buildings. The cost to bring that up to code is sometimes just physically impossible, but having a variance through that, that doesn't create a, a process. I know it's something Eric's been working on. Yeah, yeah, and I guess that's a question too, is if let's say that you, you, someone buys a historic home that we, that we want them to preserve, let's, let's move forward. We've already adopted some level of, of ordinance that the council has, has blessed and, and we now are, are moving forward with that. Someone comes forward with a, with a historic home or some property that's been designated as historic um, and they do need to bring it up to code, but that would put them outside of the allowable, what's the process for that? Well, the, the biggest thing that the, the major allowances the building code makes for historic structures have to do with aesthetics. Windows that may not meet our current hurricane and, and you know strength standards, they're allowed to go back with different windows that meet the aesthetic of the, because that's a big <laughs> part of it. Um, you know, and so everybody knows, one of the things, you know, when we get a demo permit for a house, those come to me. First thing I do is we have three historic districts per Schneider. We have a Bayfront, a White Avenue, and a downtown. I pull those maps. I locate the houses. If it is listed as a contributing or a non-contributing, then the review step that I send to the applicant is this house is located in a historic district and listed as a contributing structure. Please see the city website for information on possible tax credits or funding available. And if you go to the building department page, we have a whole tab that's historic. The Schneider reports are on there. The maps are on there. Links to the state of Alabama and the federal government for possible tax credits you can get for historic. But the, the biggest thing, and I use this term all the time, and a lot of the houses people talk about historic are nostalgic but they're not necessarily historic. If they are not a state, uh, a federal, state, or county registry, that is not a historic house, and it doesn't qualify for any of those things. So, you know, once the house uh, on Nichols was listed, then it was fine. When that originally came in, it, it was in no way 
considered a historic house because it was not on any registry. As soon as, and I, you know, we had spoken about the, the effort to do that. Yeah. When that permit came through, first thing I did is I went and taped a stop work order to the side of the excavator, told them to come see me. And then Councilman Martin and I spoke and I ended up calling your contact at the state mm -hmm. and we released them once we knew all the specifics, then we released them, tear it down. So real quick, this, this is another reason why it, so you can't have one without the other. They're symbiotic. What we ran into, even as I listed that, to try to save that history, great history, first slave woman, single tax colony. I mean, it's the birth of us, right? Fairhope, right? So, <laughs> so when you, what, what we ran into was, even if I could get that house moved, if I didn't move it to a historical, registered what he's talking about, registered historical, which means we would have to have an ordinance for historical to, to make it state or registered, then they don't get the tax credits. If I could have had an area, then that $100,000 that it cost to move that house, they would have got credit for that and they could have saved that home. So it's not, it's, it's, it's a, you, you know, that's, that's where we ran into the problem because they have to move it to a historical place. You can't just move it. Yes, as historical, that's exactly right. So, that's, so that, that's another thing that comes in play to try to save our community and some of the historical but don't, things. Didn't, didn't, and maybe I'm combining some of the things that the two of you have said, but don't we have designated historic districts right now? We do. The Schneider York? Report set up three districts, or they call them, if you look at the website, it has a White Street District, a Bayview District, I think it's Bayview, and then a downtown district, and it's got a map plotting different buildings that are either listed as contributing, non-contributing, and then the follow-on is actually a narrative report of every single one of those structures. Photograph, year built, it gives the whole rundown. Some of those reports are 300 pages long. But but that those designated districts wouldn't have allowed this house to be moved there to receive this tax credit. I, and not, I don't know how Not that without the ordinance. local ordinance. Without the, okay. that's what I'm talking about. So without the local ordinance to combine it. geographic boundaries. Yeah, state and national. You, you can't just go all over Fairhope and say, right. you've got to kind of pick a district, then they evaluate it based on contributing, not contributing. Then you kind of readjust the, the boundaries until you get uh, So that work's been done. Uh, it needs to be updated with all the changes. But you, you, you must have that local ordinance. Uh, <coughs> we're actually one of the few that I know of that actually has districts, because a lot of times when those are created, the state requires a local municipality, county, to have the local ordinances in place before they will approve those. And several of the municipalities in Baldwin County adopted the county policy, but Fairhope did not. And, and, and so theirs doesn't that's, offer yeah. protection. It doesn't. No, it doesn't yeah. offer protection. You can tear down a house with a county shield and banner right. yeah. without any specific room. The one that I, I, and I can just say, I was involved in one on Scenic 98 many years ago, and I actually met with their committee and the homeowner out there, and their requirement was he had to advertise that house within three states. For somebody wanted to come pick it up and take it, they could. If he got no responses in 30 days, then he could tear it down. Mm -hmm. That's what they did <coughs> in that instance. I think Foley is probably the only one that has um, probably the stringent architectural review. Foley has architectural review, paint colors, all, in, in everything. In one area. In, in their, their designated historic areas, historic. mostly in downtown. I have one quick question. Is there a, an age of a structure here or state or county or wherever that, that a structure has to be to be historic? I think it's 50 years old. Uh, it, at le I think it's... And, and, I don't know for sure. I think it has to be at least 50 years old, but it also doesn't say if a house is 120 years old that it is by default historic. Right, I understand. Right. But I, I, the reason I was asking that question was this. If it's 50, then every year there's the potential for a new crop of homes right. mm -hmm. of being historic. Because if you'd have told me it's 100, We're not there. then We're I would have thought for there's so few homes it could even be considered in Fairhope. But 50 is would, I mean, would, I'm in a, would add, would add 
26 year old to the equation. And I not, thought about that because we're only 124 years, 126 years out. So, even the county, well, even the county. This house was 1900, built in 1900. Right. So, if you wanted to say that I think that my home is historic because Mayor Sherry Sullivan was born in this house 50 years ago. Is this historic? That is yeah. where the land Or even 53 years. I was talking <laughs> wow. So that's where the, there's a, there's a distinction between historic structures located in historic districts and a historic landmark. The historic landmark doesn't focus on a building. It's something significant happened at this gotcha. location. Okay. And that has a separate review okay. procedure that Okay. And so now does okay. our so historic we would, we would do so does mm -hmm. our historic preservation committee are they tasked with defining you know these potential historic buildings we actually or have, landmarks? We have we hired that out. Yeah, uh, they were Schneider. Schneider, Schneider. Schneider. And they, okay, they, that they is that from, yeah. yeah. Somebody comes in and and we already have it, so they'll go check anything that wasn't you know what's the difference in fourteen or fifteen and today. Anything that was added, like you're talking about, and then what's been changed well, to the and houses. what's been demolished, because we've had quite a yes, few. I think of at least a half a dozen. And off then, the top and of then my you head. get into that problem with, with and I don't know. I'll, I'll stop that. You get into the problem where somebody inherited a home 75 years ago that may, at the time, nobody thought was that significant because maybe the mayor that was born in that house or living in that house, they were still living and it just wasn't a, and, and, and even 75 years ago, it just wasn't a thing. You know, people didn't collect baseball cards either, you know. Right. So, um, some heir inherited a home and they lived, in, who met, where, 1,000, 1,500 miles away and the house sits there and just gets dilapidated. You get a hole in the roof, next thing you know, every single thing in there is rotted, it's got termites. Mm -hmm. How do you preserve that? Well, yeah, sometimes, I mean, well, no. you know, yeah. everything everything has a useful life. And if you remember back over off of Minute Court, we had that yellow house that was there across from Greer's. Everybody talked about interior of that house was destroyed. They had structural beams that were completely collapsed. So if there's not some level of maintenance with that structure, right. Right, it's just. So you know, do we have the leeway to say we, we realize this may be a landmark, but you really can't save that structure? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, in there. There's an evaluation, there's an evaluation process. process in that ordinance, and then you can consider it a nuisance or not. And there's authorities or regulators that come up with that, and they're supposed to be trained in that. You know, from what I read. You and know, and so. there's there's buildings you would think of <laughs> that are really nice homes, look, you know, and, and have the roots of, it, but are not on the contributing list. Right. You know, people might have spent millions of dollars renovating and buying the right windows and doing all of that, but because it's been changed and edited, it's not, you know, majority of the house is not 50 years old. So right. it's not a contributing structure. It's an attractive structure, but, but so, but yes, the, the dilapidated homes, I mean, we just, there was a couple of recently, just since I've been here, that that, that probably would have been the, the problem. They sat so long and it was a, It becomes a real economic issue for whomever bought it because it's a lot of times it's cheaper to knock it down and build new than it is to try to rehab because when you start trying to rehab a 75 or 100 year old structure yeah. and a lot of them are smaller they're just not functional for what people need yeah, and that's the things I hear from forever either, either. Yeah. You know, some people didn't they, didn't they didn't build this house to be there for 200 years well and that's, yeah, that's kind of what what goes back to what Corey said a little while ago is that if you if you want to buy that house to take on the burden of renovating it or take on that task, you've got to really love the historic value of the home. <coughs> if you buy it because you like, if you bought that property for the location of it, which I think is what's happening a lot in, in, our, in our area because right. a lot of these is historic yeah. or these older homes that might qualify as historic are located in pretty prime areas of town and so people are buying it for that location and then demolishing the home that's there to build something new and much more efficient. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, look, I didn't bring this up to, to open up this can of worms, I did. but, but, but I mean, but I do think it's a discussion that needs to be had. I mean, I'd like to be able to go back to the historic preservation committee and, and you know, report this to them because I, I mean, this is, 
you know, figuring out ways to further the mission uh, of this committee is something that has come up quite a bit, you know, in the year yeah. or so that I've been on it. And, 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 you know, even to the point where I think they shifted the mission statement to, to, to become more about education than about the ordinance because it, it, it was not moving uh, in the way or at the speed that they hoped. But it still sounds like, you know, in order to, to accomplish some of the things that they hope to accomplish, the ordinance or some level of ordinance, maybe not to, to the degree that was presented to the council several years ago, but maybe something that, that might have the ability to create the ability to have this house moved and the owner get a tax credit so the house could be preserved or something along those lines might be something that we need to reconsider. Well, just in the interim, I'll make sure you understand. Every house demo permit that comes in, that location is matched against the houses that are listed on those three districts. If it's in one of the districts, the review comment goes back to the applicant, identifying that it's listed in this district. There are opportunities to try to preserve that house. And I think the line in our stock letter says, the city of Fairhope would like to make every effort to see our historic structures you know, preserved. But they're notified. But as of right now, if they come back and say, nope, I'm tearing it down, There's no then they get emailed a permit card as soon as they pay their fee and they can roll on. In my opinion, I think the first step would be adopting that ordinance. Because that ordinance does not, if you adopt the ordinance, it doesn't hold anybody from stopping them from, from doing anything because there's other steps, not just the ordinance. You know, but the first step would just at least putting the ordinance on the books so we can start moving in the right direction. Because they still could come out even with that ordinance in play, until we do the other steps, come out and demolish things. Does that ordinance create a historic preservation commission? Is that what the ordinance does? Yes. It, well, that that can. can. All right, it's one option. Who who decides who's on the historic preservation commission? The council. And is that would that be sort of a separate? I know we have a lot of committees in the city. Some of them operate differently than others. Okay. Yeah. But a commission, and that's kind of the difference between a committee and, and a commission. Commission, commission, you have to empower to make yes. decisions. Right. And, a committee yeah. can be yeah. a review. And, and they would be the one who would help with those steps that Eric was talking about, the steps that you put in place for the ordinance. Or if we did decide we wanted an architectural review, paint colors, they can do some of that. They can offer those palettes of paint colors and stuff, which I don't think we want to go that far. No. But again, I, I'm like Hunter, am an advocate for historic preservation. We've talked about it for a long time in some shape, form, or fashion. I'm not saying that we want to, you know, infringe upon property rights, but I do agree when people move into historical districts or they buy a historical home, they have some sort of um, awareness of what they're doing and they want to be able to preserve it. But I think that we as a city have to be able to educate them, work with them, and make some concessions in order to allow them to preserve those homes. And my last tidbit on this that happens all the, I have the same theory when it comes to flood zones. I don't want people arguing with me about flood zone requirements because if you buy a house in a flood zone, right. you are by default choosing to follow the rules that That's go right. along with that. But I am still stunned every day at people that come here and pay six figures for a house and have seven figures for a house and have no idea part of what they're buying because there is not much in real estate disclosure law. You know, people who are flooding, well, your east property line is creek. You know, it may not look like a creek, but when it rains, it's creek. And so oh, and being that. able to get people before they actually buy these structures to understand what they're getting into, because there's a lot of people that are buying very expensive houses. They don't know what they're buying because they're used to coming from other areas, other states, where there are much more stringent disclosure laws by real estate agents. Here, it's very basic. They, they tell them if it had a fire, had a flood, well, termites, termites and that's about it. Yeah. So if you're gonna do it, just try to catch folks before they go spend huge amounts of money on houses and then get real mad at us because they're being told what they may or may not do with it. And that's that, at least having that review, I think would cover that yeah. and, and however that looks, uh, certainly up for discussion. Great Eric Hunter, thank you all very much. Thank you, guys. Um, yeah, thank you. All right. What a great work session. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're welcome. You're welcome. Don't let the agenda fool you. Um, <laughs>
All right, so uh, l let's get into depart department head updates, and I'll start over here with Kim. And then if you get if you don't have an update, but you got something on the agenda, we'll go ahead and take care of one. Th you don't have either, Kim? Wow, good for you. Um, moving over here, I'll look at Richard. I was on vacation all last week, so no update, and I can answer any questions on item number 11, my only agenda item, and that is the selection of architecture and engineering services for the K-1 Center. Two of the city council members uh, was part of that selected committee, so we followed a pretty strict procedure, and there is one footnote in the ordinance is that we cannot bring a contract back to you with the uh, not to exceed until EDA has reviewed and approved it. So it may be a little bit of time. Okay. Thank you. Hey, Council, anybody got any questions for Richard on number 11? Uh, thank you, Richard. Wes? Jeremy's home sick tonight, so you're stuck looking at me. Um, I've got agenda items 18 through 21. Um, if you have questions on those, I'll answer them. I don't have any updates for you this week, but uh, I will address any questions for those agenda items. Wes, it looks like 18 and 19 are, are just annual things that we do. Is that right? They, they are. Um, is 18 is just regulator purchases that we do annually. Um, this is kind of trying to stay ahead of supply chain issues. Um, number 19 um, is, is a little bit different. Um, it is a cathodic protection monitoring system that we had budgeted. Um, we had $70,000 budgeted uh, for that. The purchase price 53. is $53,800. So that came in uh, somewhat under budget. I was going to ask uh, you about that. That gives us 40 uh, monitoring sites for us to monitor our cathodic protection. So that's our that's our steel piping uh, in our system. So uh, came in a little bit under budget on that. All right. Um, all right, and 20 and 21. Um, 21, 21 is the same thing. That's the gas meters. Um, again, we're just, this is just our annual purchase of those, of those meters. Um, we just got in an order. And so usually when we get in an order, we place an order uh, because the lead times are uh, what they are, and it just it, by the time that we roll back over again, we'll be running on fumes with gas meters. Wes, I saw one of these where you it was in the green sheet it said 740, but then I think that was 800 ordered. Is that did they just give us extra or? Uh, yeah, let me let me double check that number for you, Corey. Um, that was on the on the what what item was that? I can't remember. Yeah, 20 for the meters. Um, yeah, so there's 800, 800 meters. No, I'm sorry, 740. <laughs> yeah. I was looking at two different things. Yeah, but it says, yeah, I was, I, that's why I'm asking. So I, was, I didn't know if they gave us 800 and we paid that price or did they add to our our uh, invoice and we pay uh, just a question I'm not I, I just saw two different numbers that's all where did you see the 800 <clears throat> just so I'm looking at the same place the 800 is on the invoice but on the write-up I think I saw the number was 740 let's see here yeah if you look at the purchasing sheet it says how many do you need it says 740 then when you look on the invoice from ed young sales inc it says quantity 800. I mean, they gave us extra no big deal i just yeah i don't just, think they're going to give us any extras though um, okay <laughs> i wish they i wish they would <laughs> okay. be nice just, um okay Yeah, I see the quantity of 800 on my invoice. Yeah. Um, and <coughs> the corresponding dollar amount to that 800. So 
There must have been eight. We, we had to place that 800 order, not the 740. Okay. That was originally requested on, 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 their, on the request form. Yes. Um, and so the number and the quantity line up with the 800 and then the, and then the uh, 219, 570, 240. Might want to correct that on that Yep, so we'll, we'll make that correction to, yep. to 800 so instead of 740. Right. Okay. And I've got 21 as well. Um, if you've got any questions on that one. Are these expected uh, budget numbers for you, Wes? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, Council, any questions for Wes on 18 through 21? I don't have a, a question just just a comment and, and when we when we ask for these reports is any time you see something that might be on the horizon you might say well they, they look pretty good this year but next year I don't know or next year we might get a break just any right. any information like that is helpful on this. Okay. I don't know that when it's you know we have to have these items in the inventory I don't know if it matters but right. it kind of prepares us for what yes, we may or may not have to spend. And I will speak just real quick on 21. Um, 21 is the electronic um, device for reading these meters. Um, we have been notified that there's a possibility that these are not going to be available after this year. So we, you'll see the purchase amount of those. We're saying 3,000. We did have a meeting with um, <clears throat> Jeremy Little, Jeremy Morgan, and Jason Jarvis to talk about the possibility of moving gas up in the rotation maybe to the end of next year of converting to AMI since these are no longer going to be available. Um, but we are we, we did talk about that so there's a possibility that we will not purchase 3,000 but we know because they're not going to be um, you know making these anymore that we want to have the opportunity to purchase them if we need them and so we're going to go ahead I think and get a thousand and then push up our plan for AMI so we are we're working on that now so we'll probably be coming back to you with some more information on that as well. That's exactly the kind yeah. of stuff I should I, yeah. I think that's great. I was thinking that when I read this and I saw how many was getting of the AMRs and they have the smart meters now, yeah. I was going, that's why I was trying to call Jeremy today yeah. to ask him about why weren't we getting the smart meters yeah. when these have become <coughs> anti antiquated. But very good. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, that works. Thank you, Wes. Yes, sir. Pat? Thank you for the time. Good evening. Um, we have great progress going on at the ballparks with uh, new bathrooms going in at Valana and Founders Park. The uh, new light poles are up, as, as you can see. Um, so we are looking forward to grading the fields out and getting some sod down here pretty shortly. Um, I did want to bring to your attention that we did have an irrigation pump failure at the golf course. Uh, we've been having trouble with it for the past several months but it has officially gone out on us to where we can't manipulate it to keep it going any further. So we will, we will be drawing up the uh, project request form to get it before you guys for consideration as soon as we can. It's gonna be about a $30,000 unbudgeted expense. So an unforeseen item, but um, we do wanna bring it to you for your consideration as soon as we can. The problem right now, I mean, uh, you know, we're getting adequate rainfall this type of time of year the greens are not growing, uh, you know, like they would during the spring months. So water-wise, I think we're okay. The problem we're going to have is in the mornings when we have a heavy frost out there, we use irrigation to help burn the frost off to get golfers on the course more quickly. We're not going to have that capability now. So we may have to, you know, delay play a little bit as we can to, to let the sun dry up the, the frost off the greens before getting any foot traffic on there. So, Guys, any questions for Pat? Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Corey? Yes. No. CP. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. Um, Thursday, I just want to bring it to y'all's attention that we're having a uh, an event at the symbol clinic uh, for everybody to get biometric screenings. We did have a hiccup this afternoon, um, but everything has been cleared up and you're able to register online. There's posters everywhere. Um, if you're having any difficulties, just let us know. 
Does that QR code work? Yes, sir. You guys, any questions for Corey? I, I want to just ask all you in attendance and most of your department heads just to encourage your employees to get the screening done and uh, appreciate your patience. And I want to encourage, you know, the mayor and the council to get your screening done as well. I don't know that those are numbers I want to know. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I have three things on the agenda tonight. Yes, sir. 14 is the truck. Can go ahead and explain that if you will allow me the sixty-two thousand eight dollars and fourteen cents. The budget for that truck was fifty-eight. Uh, we've talked to uh, I've talked with Kim and the mayor both. Um, got two line items in the budget and the uh, for a brush cutter that we're going to bow out and not buy this year and utilize. That was for eight thousand dollars and utilize the four thousand dollars of that if if that's okay with everyone to uh, for the shortfall on that truck and then I'll be coming I'm guessing I'll be coming back uh, for the body for the truck which would be a it's a 60 inch cab to axle so it would be a, a 10 foot bed for that truck uh, and that is on state contract uh, currently and that bed's almost ten thousand dollars so um, under the same under vehicles and purchase vehicles and equipment, our budget, we had a trailer for $12,000 and we're gonna not buy that trailer and utilize that so we can stay within budget with our purchasing for this year. Okay. The, the truck increases in this year, we just, we didn't anticipate how much they went up. When you look at the MSRP on a vehicle and then look at the state contract, there's nowhere near the, the reduction that we've seen in the past. Uh, this truck is not on the state contract. We bid the truck. But when we ran this against the state contract truck, which is a Ford, uh, there's very little difference in the price. And this truck's on the yard, and the contract truck for Ford would have to order, and there's no guarantee we would get it. So that was the reason we put this out for bid. This truck is on the yard at Larry Puckett, and they held it till. You all made the decision whether we would take it or not. Okay. What else you got, Jason? And 16 is the fence quote for the wastewater plant. We got three quotes. Uh, Hagen was the lowest quote responsible quote, and that's to uh, fix the fence where all the construction work had damaged the fence, and the gate has been destroyed from the last storm we had. It blew a tree down on it. Uh, and we've got to get the plant secured. We've had a lot of unwanted traffic. Uh, just a few weeks ago, or it's probably been a month or so now, we had a, a driver that actually drove into the plant and drove on the grass that was intoxicated, and we had to call the police department. So um, this is something that I really wanted to get on the fast track and try to get this in. It'll be a card read with a gate opener so we can secure the plant. Okay. The old gate was just a swing and chain gate. And then the last thing on the, that I have, 17, is our corrosion inhibitor for the year for, for our water treatment chemicals. For corrosion. Okay. Council, any comments? Carry 8,700. Any, any questions at this time on these? Any big surprises on any of those costs? The truck was a good price for 4,500. Uh, so on the corrosion inhibitors, anything going on with that? Yes, it's continually going up. This is probably from the from last year, somewhere around a six, seven percent increase. Yeah, what well, we had, they tried to save for me doing the due diligence here. They tried to save our price, but we never ordered it. What what was? Why couldn't we get the order in to get the dollar twenty instead of dollar forty four? On the corrosion paper? Yeah, on the cares. I don't. I'm not aware of that. talking about there was a different price January 1 of 2022 versus October 1 of 2022. 
Yeah, they held it for us. It states it in here when they wrote yeah. the letter. said they tried to hold the price for us, but at this point, the, yeah. after October the 1st, they had to go up on it to the $1.44 right. because they were getting hit by outside costs. But um, And they, we can't store. There's a shelf life, that's and we can't, okay. shore the, we can't store Sorry, the chemical asking. either, so we have to buy it as we use it and what we can store at each facility, and we have six facilities. Jason left off the most important thing. On number 16, you're $17,000 under budget. Yeah, one of them was $50,000. Well, we don't want to talk about that. We want to, yeah. No, that's, that's, that's the our one we, job. When we that's go the one we budget. do want to talk about. That's right. When we go you, over you budget, ha we you have, have to, to. You have to tell him that, Jason. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> I was, I was going to make sure that he didn't sit down before making but that known. 17, I have to make the comment, uh, 17 prevents Fairhope from being the next Flint, Michigan. So I have to make that comment. That's what that's for. Yeah, Prevent right. it from being what? The next Flint, Michigan. Uh, corrosion. Yes. yes. It's for uh, corrosion. That's what that does. It's a okay. yeah. Thank you, Jason. Appreciate it's it. It's phosphate. Conrad, nothing? Yes, sir. Eric? Yes, sir. Hunter? Got a couple of zoning cases. Um, look at them. All right, so let me go through here then. Um, got the two public hearing, the ordinance number seven, Mayor. That'll be something we can all talk about. Um, number eight and nine are taking over streets. No issue with either one of those, Hunter. Um, Ten is, is the change in the signees on the accounts. Um, 12 and 13 are for the New Year's fireworks and entertainment. I don't know that we need any. Uh, 15. Uh, that's just our, our you, you, for the. Um, was that? That's, the, that's for a, a bay clan and blade bay. Uh, yeah, that's, a, that's our yearly city budgeted. City. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have two appointments to the Bike and Ped Committee, Mike Walker and Morgan Russell. And then last is the uh, Baykeeper Grandman Triathlon. Um, all right. 15 minutes. Well, we've got 15 minutes till council starts. So let's take a break and try to get back and start at 6 o'clock on the dot. <laughs> 